latest round of wind and rain getting underway, and some areas have had it all day long. Uh, we've got a lot of flash flood warnings up in parts of Ohio and points southward. Tornado watches are up tonight. Uh, also in uh, parts of the Carolinas, we'll talk about that. We'll look at the prospects for the weekend, which I think at best we can say is mixed. But all of that is coming up in short order tonight. On the Joe and Joe Weather Show on this Thursday, the 11th of April, brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow, our affiliate. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system and join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is on the description of this podcast. And if you do decide to purchase the Tempest weather station, which is very good, by the way, because I have one, and uh, any, or anything else, because they got lots of gadget, gadgets and gizmos uh, and smart weather fashion. You don't leave money on the table. Use the coupon code WINTER2324, because if you do, you will get. You'll get 10% off, and you're still staying with WINTER2324, aren't you? Yeah, I guess. You know, we need reminders of it. <laughs> I told, reminders. I, told Renata, I told Renata that the first thing I'm – it's going to be in the 70s, it looks like, or close to 70 early next week. And I said the first thing i got to do on Monday is pull out the snowblower, start it up, and just let it run down and get rid of all the gas because it ain't looking like I'm going to be using that anymore this season. <laughs> um, oh, I think you're right, Rabbit. You're right. Yes, you won't be using. Yes. You don't, all right. lighted, you don't think I'd throw a lighted match in there, would you? <laughs> oh, you might, Rabbit. You might. <laughs> Welcome tonight to everybody on the chat board. And for those of you who are not on the chat board but busy lurking about in the background, we welcome you to tonight's Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel so you don't miss the Joe and Joe Weather Show po podcast. Otherwise, you know, life might not even be worth living without us. We're on Sunday through Thursday at 735, Fridays and Saturdays when there's uh, big storms around. And if we decide to add an extra show, we'll always tell you, if you like the show, hit the like button. Because we love it when you like the show. And Joe gets to ring the bell if we get to 100, which, yeah. geez, once the winter's like, over, Craig, people go away. So that doesn't happen as often as we'd like, but no matter. Craig Carlberg, I didn't know that you were that old. He, he says on the chat board, I might be pushing 90 on Monday. Really? God, That's God bless, Craig. God bless. Yes. Happy birthday. <laughs> pushing 90 woo uh, the, the, you got to 90 that's a great that's a that's a great thing yeah exactly yep oh that was unusual my dog just growled for some reason <laughs> i'm not sure why he heard something what's the matter jj you hear something it's usually by now he's already half asleep on the bed uh he, I don't know. By the way, we had a, uh, you know, last night when I, I mentioned about the fact that we had a downpour go by and it was a briefly heavy downpour because, you know, it sound, because I have a metal roof. So it sounds like soft, you know, somebody's dropping baseballs on it. Um, as it turned out, I went out on the deck uh, after the show and the wind, Joe, I, oh my God, the wind was every bit of, 25 to 40 with gusts to 50. And it, wow. last, and it lasted for quite a while. So I was just kind of curious. And I was looking on the radar and I said, okay, well, you know, there's all these thunderstorms that were down from mostly from Atlanta south, which is 100 miles south of me. But it's like, that's a little bit too far south for me to get impact from, from that. And there were some, you know, some showers that were on the northern edge. And I think there was one cell that I looked at. Turns out, Turns out, because a lot of the Atlanta forecasters were talking about this, I happened to catch one uh, this evening. A gravity wave developed uh, in uh, in, nor in uh, northwest Georgia last night, and there were gusts of forty to fifty miles per hour all through the northern half of the state. In fact, uh, my town at the at the uh, you know local airport, you know the Blairsville International Airport. Um, and if you see the road that goes to the airport, you'd understand why I'm laughing. Um, they had a gust of 56 miles an hour from, from this. Yeah, it was very, very unusual. 
Uh, meanwhile, you know, we've got this low, which actually is tracking a little further east uh, than, uh, than modeled, uh, which is, you know, in some respects, it's delayed rain coming in uh, for eastern Pennsylvania to southern New England, but it's going to get there during the overnight. But we've got this, you know, there was a line of severe storms that moved across the, east, the eastern Carolinas this morning. Now there's a second line of storms that's developed in western North Carolina and southern Virginia, which we'll look at on the radar. Just a, a rather unusual night. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, the rain probably will be manageable by the time it reaches, you know, eastern PA to southern New England for the most part. Uh, the wind, you know, they, they have wind advisories up for the coastal counties of uh, New Jersey and Long Island uh, for maybe some gusts over 50. But overall, I think this is going to be, should be, I hate to use the word routine because in a sense it is routine that we get a major storm once a week, but this one's probably more low end than any, than the other ones were. It uh, certainly appears that way. Just uh, reading here, Joe, on um, a couple of websites here, and uh, our dear friend uh, Dr. Cohen is talking about a, uh, a stratospheric teleconnection of sorts. I'm not exactly sure what he's making the allusion to. Um, he's showing, showing a re regional geopotential polar cap height plot showing something unique a downward influence from see I, I love i love this how you know why don't you just put it into plain english so well, he, write, he, he writes for he writes for high-end weather people exactly sometimes <laughs> it's so high-end that even people who have been in weather for 40 years don't understand what the hell he's, <laughs> he's talking about into a downward influence from a polar vortex disruption in early march reaching the troposphere resulting in greenland blocking and simultaneous simultaneously signs of Final warming in the stratosphere, exclamation point. So what does all that mean? You know what it means? If he, if, is, he, is he alluding to maybe we're going to get a big snowstorm at the end of the month here in parts of uh, the northern United States? <laughs> or, it's just, well, or it's probably just going to be a, a little bit of a cool down. Or, or just the usual spring you know, gloom and doom when you get into the... Yeah. Everybody misinterprets the gloom and doom thing. You know, folks, when, to me, in my mind, I well today here it it poured rain it was it was way th this was actually Joe this is a, today here was a perfect day of self destruct su sunshine because uh, it poured rain this morning and then it stopped and then the sun came out and then it it poured rain again and then it stopped and then the sun came out and then it poured rain again I mean and now we're you know poured rain you know. I would say the vast majority of the time today it's been raining, but every time it stopped raining and the sun would come out, we'd get more showers, more downpours that developed. And the funny thing was because because of the mountains, it's all hidden on the radar. These were not high tops. It wasn't high top stuff. It was all low top stuff. And, you know, I'm looking at the radar and it's like, I, you know, there was nothing here. I mean, there was nothing anywhere close. And it's just, I mean, torrential torrential rain i'm guessing we probably have maybe about an inch and a half worth I, I i didn't check my rain gauge today but um the weekend looks kind of mixed i think for uh for 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 the northeast on uh, and the northern mid-atlantic states because you know now it looks like this low in the upper trough are going to take a little longer to get out of the way so you got to wonder whether there's going to be some you know some cloud issues it's on saturday and maybe even a shower or two issue uh, until the upper trough pulls out, and then you get a break, and then you got this cold front that's coming down Sunday. Maybe maybe a couple of showers uh, late Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. Late Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, I would agree with for uh, for possible shower activity. And it looks a lot. It looks uh, cloudier than what I was thinking of for this upcoming weekend from yesterday. I still think though we're going to have some strong gust. At my God, gusty winds look like they're going to persist right on into uh, the start of the weekend on Saturday and then kind of tail off on Sunday. And then, of course, back to work and school on Monday. And it looks like not only is it going to be bright and sunny, but the winds may start uh, rearing their heads again. You're starting to rev back up again. So right. uh, one, thing about, one thing about this upcoming next few days, wind is certainly going to be a significant uh, factor. All right, let's check what's going on tonight because we do have a number of uh... – 
watches and warnings uh, regarding weather that's going on at the moment at 7.46 p.m. Eastern Time. And by the way, we hope everybody had a great day today, which is nice. Uh, we have uh, that red that you see from southwestern Pennsylvania, parts of southeastern Ohio, down through West Virginia, and then in a narrow band into, into uh, southwestern Virginia. Those are all flash flood warnings uh, that are up because it's been raining there pretty much all afternoon and evening, and, and they've got uh, uh, some, some serious flooding happening in those areas. Flood watches surrounding that, the yellow areas in southeast Ohio and West Virginia, indicative of a, of a working tornado watch, as well as in parts of southwest Virginia into uh, western North Carolina. I think we actually have a live tornado warning at the moment in one county in North Carolina. Wind advisories all across the south and up the Appalachians, down into Florida, also from uh, central Mississippi to northern Louisiana, northeast Texas, wind advisories around uh, over the state of Michigan, northern Indiana and Ohio, wind advisories in upstate New York and coastal Maine, wind advisories for, for Long Island and coastal New Jersey, uh, along with, uh, there's been some coastal flooding that's been ongoing here pretty much all week long, so that, that continues. Uh, so that's our that's the status of the current storm. Not a whole lot happening in the West. A few flood watches in southern Utah, a few winter weather advisories in the Sierra Nevadas, and then you've got these red flag warnings up in uh, across uh, New Mexico and to southeast Colorado, as well as central Kansas and on up through much of Nebraska and to South Dakota because of dry conditions and 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 fire risks there. And now here's the the satellite loop tonight. And if you look after the uh, the, the sunset line passes, uh, the bright white clouds that stand out in southwest Pennsylvania down into West Virginia and southeastern eastern Ohio. That's where all the flash flood warnings are. That's been you know, pretty much a problem uh, for much of the day, and they're still ongoing. Uh, there's uh, the thunderstorms that are moving through North Carolina now in southwest Virginia, and you can see the little blow up. Uh, it's almost like a funnel shape of the cloud, the clouds there on the satellite, and then you got the cold front sweeping eastward, and that's pushing clouds uh, across uh, Alabama and into Georgia. And there's probably some rain going on with that. Uh, meanwhile, on the radar, as we take a look, uh, there's um, I don't know, there's there's some some rain on the radar in northern New Jersey and Long Island. It's kind of like an arm that goes back across northern Pennsylvania, and then it turns southward down through uh, southeast Ohio, West Virginia. There's all these flash flood warnings there are up that are up. And we've got those, it's like two tornado warnings popped up in North Carolina there. Now it's down to one, uh, with one severe thunderstorm warning that's left. But all of this is going to have to work its way to the northeast. It's hard to imagine, Joe, the back edge of the rain goes all the way back to Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, and northern Alabama. It's hard to imagine that this rain is going to get get out of here with any kind of speed. This thing seems to be uh, moving, you know, making its time shifting eastward. Yeah, it looks like, you know, yesterday I was thinking that maybe we'd be done with this by first thing in the morning on Friday. But now I pretty much decided that um, we may pick up, you know, let's say, a couple of tenths of an inch from daybreak until noontime tomorrow. But there may still be enough moisture in the atmosphere to kick off a couple of more showers uh, between midday and the end of the day tomorrow, and so it, it's good. It's, it, it, and, and I, I don't really see all that much chance of sunshine now. I was kind of hoping that we'd break out into some sun later in the day, but we may stay cloudy through much of the day tomorrow. And as you just pointed out at the onset of the broadcast, Joe, we may be seeing uh, quite a bit of unsettled conditions linger right on into the weekend of the two days, two weekend days. Looks like the drier. Well, maybe not necessarily the drier, but maybe the brighter of the two will be Sunday. It'll also be the milder of the two. We've got a, much, a cool down of sorts for Saturday, I think, along with a gusty wind. The winds will die off a bit on Sunday. But then the, the next disturbance moving in our direction may bring some late day showers in here on Sunday. So kind of a mixed up, a potpourri of all different kinds of conditions expected over the upcoming weekend. And again, tomorrow... Not really all that great either with uh, the threat of showers in the morning and again later in the day. Uh, the uh, From Tornado HQ, the tornado warning that I mentioned earlier, uh, that has another 24 minutes to go. And by the way, 
It's uh, 7.51 Eastern time. So if you're watching this later, obviously uh, a lot of this current weather is dated. So uh, make sure you go to weather.gov to get the latest weather information regarding severe weather or any, any other kind of weather that's going on. Um, uh, this is for Stokes, Surrey, and Yadkin counties in North Carolina. Severe thunderstorm capable of producing a tornado was located over Boonville, moving northeast at 35. There's two severe thunderstorm warnings also in play. The tornado warning is inside uh, this severe thunderstorm warning that goes from th another 38 minutes, and that's for uh, Allegheny. I'll get a let me close up on the radar so you can you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is for Allegheny, Stokes, Surrey, Wil Wilkes. Yadkin, Carroll, Grayson, and Patrick counties in North Carolina and Virginia. And the other one is for uh, Catawba, Catawba County, Davie County, Treadle County, or Treadle. I can't see with my glasses here. Uh, Iridell. I was wrong on both counts. Iridell and Rowan counties in, in North Carolina. So that seems to be the, uh, the busy spot of the night here. Uh, with this um, this this storm system, which as I said is taking its time, I'm just going to bring up the surface map. Let's see if I can. There we go. Let's get the surface map up to see where it is. Yeah, I mean the low center is in north northwest Ohio. They actually have another low analyzed in eastern Kentucky and a warm front that runs. You know, the Virginia-North Carolina state line in the west and then kind of curls up into central Virginia to Chesapeake Bay. You know, temperatures are in the 70s to the south of that, 60s to the north. Then there's another warm front uh, that's drawn from that Ohio low that arcs up into Canada to about Toronto, then uh, curls back down uh, through, through central New York the Pennsylvania New York line to the New Jersey New York line and is looks like it cuts right across White Plains and through the Long Island Sound. So it's a very complex uh, setup here uh, with this. You've got uh, multiple low centers being analyzed. Uh, you've got uh, uh, all these fronts that they've. I wonder, you know, have they over? Look at look at this. I got one front that's off the Georgia coast, another one that's moving through western Georgia now and approaching me, and a third front back through Mississippi. This is this is a very complex mess that we have. You you think this is complex? I mean, back in the day when uh, at least when I got started, when I was going to college, they even they even uh, coded the uh, the various fronts on the weather map. I mean, I, for example, I remember that a very strong cold front would be known as a four eighty six cold front. I mean, they don't do that anymore, but I mean, it was just additional stuff to add to the map to make it a, 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 a mishmash, if you will. You know, you really had to look twice before you could understand everything. So, uh, but things are getting better, I guess. Yeah, well, it has been, um, it has been simplified since, every, since everything has, since um, everything is done for you now uh, by, uh, by computer rather than by hand. That's right. Who does? Who does? I mean, like, the, does anybody it, do hand plots anymore? I I was going to say I, I'll bet you that people, the kids who are in college, working their way toward a degree in meteorology, um, they they don't they don't. But you know, first of all, Joe, on, like when we went to City College in New York. They had two or three of those old-fashioned clanking, what do they call them, R35, R44 teletype machines right. with the hammer. Bu, 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 bu. And I mean, like on Circuit A, we would get every hour, hourlies from different parts of the country. You could rip them off, sit down with a map, and then you could just plot your way around and, and, and draw. If you, and the, the, the guy with the fastest hands, I thought, was Pete Bergman. Uh, who I eventually worked with at uh, Private Weather Forecasting Service, he could do like a whole hourly in like an hour and a half, almost two hours. And he did, and it was like a work of art when Pete was concerned. Who does that anymore? Nobody does it anymore because everything is done for you by by computer. But I mean, like, and I, I, I feel we've lost something because back in the day when we used to do that kind of stuff, 
you would plot and you would actually see and you'd get a feel of the weather. And I mean, I'd, I'd always get excited during impending big storms when I'd see like pressure falling rapidly on the uh, on the teletype report or whatever. And, uh, you know, you, 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 you get a, a better handle as to what's going on as opposed to now where all you have to do is just turn on your computer and go to the latest surface analysis and boom, there it is. Uh, done already done for you, but uh, I think we've I think we've lost a little something by uh, not be not doing that sort of st- that stuff like we, we used to. I kid Renata, uh, who used to work with me at that private office. We didn't have radar. We didn't have color radar back then in the seventies. What you did, you'd go on Circuit C and you'd get all the r- latest radar information, and they were tabulated in numbers levels one right. through. Six. And we had plastic grids. They looked like um, um, graph paper. You'd put that over a map, and then you would plot out the ones, the twos, the threes, the, and find find the areas of uh, on the radar where the heaviest rains were. And you'd use a grease pencil for that. Who well, does the, that? The radars, the, the radars were, were, were very, you know, compared to today, were very primitive then. I'll, I'll say this. The hand... I don't know that I would go, want to go back to the day of, of plotting, plotting the radars by hand. Um, maps, yes. The radars, not so much. No, of course not. Of not course so not. That, yeah, that's that's crazy that you got the the color radar now and uh, uh, showing a Doppler radar and showing hook echoes here. That you don't need the, the the plot that anymore. But I really think that uh, in the case of snow, for example, a big snowstorm, it's worth plotting. A sectional, or even oh, a small. Oh yeah, I I agree. I agree. I mean, like the radar, for example. The radar will show you, for example, a broad area of what you would imply would be snow falling over an area, but that could be just Virga. Because if you do the plot, you'll find out from the ground that no snow is actually not reaching the ground, and so it's actually not snowing where the radar is suggesting that it is snowing. So that helps. That that certainly will help you. And again, I yearn for that uh, for the good old days, but I don't think you can get that anymore. I mean, you could go on. You can go on the various National Weather Service sites, click on a certain area on the map, and you can get the latest information. But you have to do that one after another after right. another. I, you can't even, you know. Rich Rothbansky makes a good point. Even the surface observations aren't in, aren't what they used to be. Correct, because a lot of those are ASOS. Right. A lot of those, are, you know. I mean, case in point. Here's the case in point that this drove me up the wall just a couple of days ago. I I wanted to see. Because in the sky where we were at him to see the eclipse in Plattsburgh, uh, New York, I mean, we had a, a whole deck of high clouds. So I went back to the observations uh, for Plattsburgh Airport to find out just how high those clouds were. Would you believe, Joe, every observation for all the hours during the eclipse, clear, 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 clear. So it was all done, you know, by automation. They didn't have right. any anybody who was actually physically there physically making measurements of the altitude of the clouds or whatever. Clear, 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 clear. clear. And, and that, that, that just blew my mind. You know? Well, a lot of times with the automated, the automated ones too on certain stations, um, it could be raining, you know, it, it could be raining all, out, all over the place and there'll be one automated station in there that for whatever reason the sensor's not working right and it'll say partly sunny. Yes. Or, you know, it's raining in 50 everywhere, and then you'll have the one automated station that says mixed precipitation. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it's just it's it's just not what it used to be. Uh, but nothing ever is. Uh, things always change. Rich, uh, Rich, Rothmansky, Rich Rothmansky on the chat board says that these are level three airports, like, for example, Plattsburgh. Anything right. above anything above 12,000 feet is noted as clear. Well, that doesn't that that doesn't really help me any, does it? I mean, I really no. wanted to know the altitude of those clouds because people were bo- not bothering me. All right, they were bothering me to some, to some degree in the hotel that we were staying at on Monday morning asking, you know, is it going to cloud up? Should we leave? Should we go to Vermont or whatever? And I was telling them, I said, look, from what I can see, the clouds are going to be no worse than 25,000 feet ceiling. And I wanted to know in the aftermath, you know, exactly how high those clouds were. Well, they obviously they obviously they were above twelve thousand feet, Rich. But I just wanted to know the exact height. But uh, anyway, that's that's the world of today, ladies and gentlemen. Things, you know, we thought we thought in the twenty first century we would have things would get so much better and marvelous. I, to tell you the gosh darnest truth, I think in some some ways 
back in the 1960s and 70s, things were a lot better then as opposed to, to now. Well, I don't disagree. Vincent Croce, you worked on the stock exchange. Oh, my God, that's wonderful. Uh, I think if I came back, you know, if I come back in, an, in another life, that's where I would have liked to have worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That, that, that's got to be so cool. Um, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, all right, rainfall amounts uh, from this. So I've just, this is, these are uh, three day rainfall amounts. So uh, in the Northeast, you can see it's pretty much every, anywhere from three quarters of an inch to as much as an inch and a half in some places. They see the heavier areas up over Lake Huron and on up into Canada, the few patches of heavy rain. And by the way, this is in addition in areas in Pennsylvania down to West Virginia uh, and into Western North Carolina. This is on top of what's already fallen. Uh, much of the plains dry. Uh, much of uh, south is dry, except for the southeast, uh, where there could be still a few more hundredths. Uh, and uh, also in the uh, west, where we've got some light precipitation coming into the western states. If we look at the seven-day rainfall, obviously everything here is front and loaded uh, in the northeast uh, and uh, in the west. Uh, and, uh, three quarters of an inch to an inch and a quarter or so for California. Uh, up into Oregon, also for from Wyoming northwest into uh, Montana, and not a lot of very little of this is going to be snow, except in the highest highest elevations. From what I was looking at uh, a little while ago, so uh, here's our surface low uh, tonight on the GFS, and I've, I'm using the version of the GFS that shows what the radar is supposed to look like. So if we bring the radar back up. On the wide shot, you see it here because it's eight o'clock, zero Z, midnight Greenwich time, and here's the GFS, and it's not that far off, uh, but uh, the low is centered uh, in right in the middle of Ohio uh, when they plot the new map, which won't get till about nine thirty, and uh, the radar echoes are just sort of scattered about in the northeast, but become more numerous. So you can see the heavier. Uh, echoes in Ohio and West Virginia into North Carolina. Well, that low is going to just move northeastward over Lake Erie. So rain comes in, really starts to fill in on the radar between now and 1 a.m. And then that area pulls out. But the surface low is east of Lake Huron, and we still have the upper trough. You know, Joe, there's some kind of arm that uh, tomorrow afternoon that runs from upstate New York down to just north of New York City with some heavy cells in there. And I bring that up because SPC had this last last night, and they have it again tonight. Uh, I'm going to come back to today's. Uh, but they've got general thunderstorm risk tomorrow for much of uh, New York State, Vermont, western Connecticut, and western Massachusetts to Long Island, New Jersey, eastern PA all the way down to Virginia, North Carolina, and back into uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. So the upper trough tomorrow maybe might set off a, a thunderstorm in, in, that, uh, in that line that you saw. It wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. And, of course, it's April now, and uh, sometimes in April you get these uh, type of systems that move on through with pea-sized hailers, as they sometimes are called by some of the, uh, the old veteran forecasters, uh, uh, it, and it's it's quite possible well, these the lo, lo, low top convection, if you will. So it would not be surprising if that were the case. And again, this would not be this would not this would uh, not rank as something severe, but it would be something that certainly would be uh, more than just your you know garden variety thunderstorm. So we'll see how it all plays out tomorrow. It could be an interesting day. Slight to enhance risk tonight in that area that we've been describing. Uh, in the uh, central Appalachians and then on up into uh, western West Virginia and Ohio. That certainly is playing out, We're certainly from the standpoint of uh, rain and flash flooding. Also a marginal risk left for a small section in central Florida. Tomorrow, it's just general thunderstorms in the east, but they do have a marginal risk in eastern Oregon, western Idaho, and northern Nevada, uh, but it's not uh, tornado risk. And day three, which is Saturday into Sunday, a uh, little area there from uh, northwest Ohio and northeastern Indiana, northwestward into northeastern Minnesota, and also across northern California, much of Oregon, central Idaho into Montana. 
and coastal California from north of San Francisco down to almost to, but not quite to Los Angeles, where they've got some uh, general thunderstorm risks there. So the problem with this is that, and I'm going to switch over to the upper air. The problem with this is that this upper low, which is in northern New York on Saturday, uh, doesn't really rush out to the east very fast. It just kind of stretches up uh, from northern Vermont into toward Montreal by Saturday morning, and we still got troughing and a little short wave that's in that northwest flow that comes through Saturday afternoon. So don't be surprised. I think you know the, your assessment about Saturday is correct. Probably more clouds than than than, than we thought yesterday. And who knows? I think there still might even be the chance for a shower, particularly if you go north and east up into New England. There's probably going to be some uh, showers around on Saturday. And then we've got another short wave, which is very hard to find, but it's there. Uh, you see there's an upper low right up here in, ja in, in east of James Bay. So there's a little short wave that's coming down in that flow. Uh, there's not a, it's nothing, you know, of consequence, really, but just a little bit of a kink. But it's enough to produce a cold front with the chance maybe for a shower. And meanwhile, if we go to the North America view, maybe we can figure out what's going on here. Uh, but it looks like when we kind of go into a ridge position next week for a while. And then, then we get, yeah, it looks like there's a little bit of blockiness developing over Greenland again, uh, which is maybe what um, what uh, Ms., Ms. Dr. Cohen was talking about. Yeah. And now suddenly, you know, at the end of next week, there's some sort of troughing along the East Coast uh, with a cold, a colder flow coming down out of Canada. That is not um, uh, a uh, a signature for warm temperatures. I mean, the first part of next week, yes, but you know, late next week and going into next weekend, if this is right, that's uh, that's going to be somewhat for this time of year anyway. It's going to be chilly air. And then that pulls out, and then we finally get back into a ridge position late in the forecast period, which is in about two weeks. The last day on the long range is April 27th. Uh, if we look at what the surface is doing, let's take a look at that and see what's what's in play. Let's roll it back. And so there's your low, and you can see there's areas of precip there Friday, Friday night, and even on Saturday, Saturday morning, Joe, there's you know, all sorts of measurable leftover from the overnight and still maybe a couple of stray showers until that pulls out. You get a brief break and then here comes Sunday system with this cold front that moves on through. Meanwhile, here in the southeast, uh, after a, a, a chilly day tomorrow, we're going to start warming up and I think we're going to be up above up near 80 from Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, if this is correct, with dry weather and sunshine. So I can't wait for that. And uh, here's a storm little system coming into California with uh, some rain and some mountain snows. Uh, that forms a deep low in Nebraska. We talked about this yesterday. It's a little less deep than what was being indicated yesterday. But again, this low goes to the west up toward Lake Superior, but it takes a track a little further east than yesterday. So now by the middle of next week, you know, late Tuesday, Tuesday night, there's some kind of warm front, cold front combination coming through with some showers. And then maybe another front late in the week. And, and as we move into next weekend, yeah, that's that's a bit on the, you know, that's a bit on the chilly side. Let's look at the thermos. Let's look at the uh, temperature. Look at this. So this is for next weekend. Let's so here's here's this, here's the uh, below and above normal temperatures. So obviously, you know, the weekend is mostly above, except when it's raining uh, on Friday and Saturday. Uh, then we're above normal, uh, above normal into Wednesday and Thursday, and then here comes. Look at all. Look at all that blue. You, you didn't see this at all during the winter, Joe. Right? <laughs> look at all. Look at that. It's spreading out from southern Canada, the Rockies, the Plains, the Great Lakes, and into the north, into the east. Uh, for uh, starting from around, well. Out late this week, up in the plains behind that low, it reaches the east coast on Friday, begins to reach the east coast on Friday. So, next weekend and all of the following week, below normal temperatures. Look at that. That's crazy. Have you noticed that over the recent last several years, we, we've been sitting here, all the winter weather lovers have been dying 
during you know December, January, February, and you, you throw in the towel, and then what happens? We get to April, and some in some years, I remember that one year we had snow, trace of snow on the 9th of May. We get to April or May, and the pattern that we were waiting for all winter suddenly materializes after the official start of spring, it, it, and it's happening again, it looks like, this year. It's so grossly unfair. Yes. It really is. Oh, and, and Scott Briller, I mentioned yesterday we were doing those cities of the latest snowfall. April 25th, 1910, Atlanta, Georgia blanketed with 1.5 inches of snow while seeing their latest freeze ever with a morning low of 32. The high that day, Joe, was 39. <laughs> and it was the second time ever that the high never got out of the 30s in the month of April. I mean, that is, and here's, I got the snow map uh, for that. Let me bring that up on the screen. Thank you, Scott, for sending this, because I was really curious about it. Uh, but this is this is how the snowfall set up. And, oh boy, look at me. So where I am, I would have gotten um, four to five inches. Yeah. Of course, this was back in 19... 1910. 1910. Um, and I wasn't around in 1910, 1911. Yes, 1910. No, um, but look at that. That's uh, that's impressive. I would I would wonder what the, you know. I wonder what the setup was. It must have been some monstrous trough in the eastern part of the United States for this to, to do that. For, yeah, for this to have happened. I mean, uh, that's just crazy. Oh well. Or as Nora, Nora O'Donnell on CBS News, Evening News, would say, fascinating. <laughs> I should trademark that word. Yes. All right, do you have Briller Jeopardy? Yes, I do. I do have Briller Jeopardy tonight. All right, but before you do, you know, uh, Dr. Ruben Fairchild on the chat board uh, wants to know if you're monitoring the chat board because he has an inversion photography question he needs answered. I have no idea what inversion photography is. Do you? No. All right. Well, you can ask the question, but it sounds like Joe's not going to be able An to. Inversion, inversion no. photography question. All right. And of course, well, I, know, I know what an inversion is. I know what the hobby of photography is, but I never saw both of them put together. Well, maybe he's talking about, Joe, one of those questions where, you know, is uh, what what is the correct exposure when we have an inversion Let's say over New York, when you can see the bottom part of the sky looks like an ugly sooty brown, and the top part looks like a beautiful deep blue. That's there's your inversion. Uh, okay, uh, Tom Contino. That's Tom Contino is asking about um, uh, where you can look up old weather maps. So I, I just put up a link to that surface analysis map that I had up. If you go on the upper left, there's a link up there to the surface archive page. So uh, it's, you could, you could, you could look at old weather maps there. Uh, so click on the link after the show's done and take a look. Uh, he says, um, uh, it, it's when you can see Canada, can it, wait a minute. It says, it's when you can see Canadian cities across from Lake Ontario or Lake Michigan. And Christina Pedia adds, a positive image is a normal image, a negative image is a total inversion in which the light appears dark and vice versa. Okay. I am, I'm, I'm lost, but that's all well, right. Oh, Ruben wait, says it's a weather phenomenon of some kind. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, this, this sounds like... This sounds like a Fata Morgana, a Fata Morgana. And what, what that is, is that, um, I, um, what's, what's the island, Joe, that's right, what's, what's the island that's right off of the coast of Sicily? Um, uh, or is what, it, Capri? Capri? There's a, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a, an, an illusion where I, more it, might off, be, it, it might be Capri where they have those, you know, those caves with the, all right, I'm gonna ha hang on for a second. I just want to. I'm gonna call up, but I, I think I know what he's what he's referring to. Um, uh, Corsica. What am Sardin I talking about? Sard Sardinia. Malta. Am Malta? I talking about Malta or whatever? Uh, like, I think like, like a malted milk. Yeah, 
I th- I think I th- I I I'm all right. I'm not uh, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think it, 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 the Fata Morgana was this: that if you were, let's say, on the island of Malta, um, no, not on Malta, on in Sicily, and you're looking out over the out over uh, the Ionian Sea. That more often than not, you would not be able to see the southern or southwestern tip of Italy because it was beyond the curvature of the Earth. But because of the atmosphere, because of an atmospheric inversion, so to speak, uh, when warm air overrides cold air or cold air overrides warm air, I'm not exactly sure which, that you actually, uh, the atmosphere would act like a lens and would actually bring the image of, uh, of Italy above the horizon. So theoretically, m- more often than not, when you looked out over the Ionian Sea from from Sicily, you wouldn't see anything. You just see a flat o- flat o- open ocean. But there were times because the atmosphere was in a particular type of situation where the light rays were bent above the horizon, and so that you were able to see Italy, the the image of Italy on the horizon. Again, caused by atmospheric refraction or whatever. And the 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 ancient people who looked at this said, "Oh, the sea fairy is at work." or as it was called, the Fata Morgana. Again, uh, due to, I think, uh, atmospheric inversion or something like, uh, something along those lines. Uh, that's, I, 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 and again, I, I apologize. I know it has something to do, it, 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 the, the, the legend dealt with some place, it might have been Italy or Sicily, or might even have been Greece. But uh, um, you, know who, you know who had it in his book? In his atm- is, is the science and wonders of the atmosphere. Stan Getzelman, one of our professors from City College, mm-hmm. he he wrote about the Fata Morgana. And Joe, here's a funny thing: uh, that, that on the TV show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, um, the, and this was the one that was hosted by Regis Philbin, the original version. That there was like a question for like one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and the question was, "What is a Fata Morgana?" And of the four possibilities one of them was a mirage that's basically what it was it was a mirage or an optical illusion and the whole hundred and twenty five thousand dollars was riding on that question and the, the person who was asked that question said you know i don't know what it is i'm going to take the sixty four thousand and go home and i'm screaming meanwhile at the tv i'm saying it's a mirage it's a mirage <laughs> and and i said to renata Lee, i said you think if i were on that show they would ask the question like that no they'd probably ask me a question about shakespeare or opera or whatever. It's something I wouldn't know about. But uh, anyway, I think that that's what uh, what they were making reference to about the uh, about the uh, about the uh, and Jason Fox writes on the chat board of Fata Morgana, type of mirage that produces multiple overlapping or stacking images that actually change and distort, creating an elaborate dynamic mirage that is typically unrecognizable as compra. Compra? What's compra? As Kappa, then he probably ran out of characters because you could only oh. write up to 200 characters on a message. What? Whatever. Um, all right. Uh, how about a little yeah. Briller Jeopardy? Compared Do you have to the any? original object, whatever. Anyway, should we go to Briller Jeopardy now? Yes, please do. Winded uh, explanation here. All right. So, Mr. Briller, the chairman, once again continuing on the latest measurable snowfall, and these are for the following cities. Starting with Burlington, Vermont. I do not expect anybody to get the year, but what was the date of the latest measurable snowfall in, in Burlington, Bur- Vermont? Yes. I will say June 3rd. Uh, that's a little bit too far out, Joe. Okay. I just took a guess. So we're talking May here. April 25th. No, this is Burlington, Vermont. Um, May 1st for Craig Carlberg, May 15th for Patrick Darcy. Uh, you guys get out of April, May 30th. Pretty close, pretty, pretty close Pat, Patrick. May, May 15th, uh, Lee Oprobitsky, May 9th. So I oh. guess it's between the 9th and the 15th. Vincent Croce, yes. May 20th. Well, exactly between the 9th and the 15th, if you want the honest to God truth. So, um, the 12th. The twelfth, May twelfth, fairly recent actually, uh, not not in the nineteenth century, nineteen sixty six. They had point three inches uh, in Burlington, Vermont, of snow. Okay, next. 
Buffalo. Buffalo. I'll say I'm going to split the difference. And I'll, well, you know, that's kind of weird over there in Western New York sometimes, too. Um, how about May 15th? Uh, not far enough. Not far enough. Believe it or uh, not. Okay. So Later it's than, after May 15th, folks. After May 15th. Leon says May 18th. That's close. Vincent Croce says May 25th. That's too far. Okay, so it's between 18 and 25. Mark Franz Sr., Rich Roth Mansky, Frank May, all say May 20th. And that's it, May 20th. And so did Patrick Darcy. 1907, May 20th, 1907, Buffalo had 0.1 inches of snow, Okay, believe it or not. How about Boston? Boston, well, if New York's May 9th, I'll say... I'll say May 13th. Well, you're you're in that ballpark, Joe. In fact, the year that one of the two years that New York reported snow on May 9th, the one that uh, was not 2020 but 1977. So, what does that tell you about Boston, which is also 1977? May 10th. May 10th. Half an inch, believe it or not, at, right. at Boston. And uh, Rich Rothmansky got that one, May 10. Now, when you said May 9th for Central Park, that was just a trace. But what we're talking about is something a little bit more than a trace. For right. Central Park, the date was? Um, April 25th. A little bit later. April 29th. The 29th. Yeah, I was, wasn't April sure. April 29th, was... Carol, Carol DeChera got that. And... Uh, they, in, in 1874, on April 29th, they picked up three inches, half, right? No, no, a half, half inch. inch. Half inch? Half inch. Yeah. Okay. And here's the last one. This is surprising to me. I don't even remember. Well, I do remember, you know, I do remember this particular year having uh, a few late snowfalls. Philadelphia. It shows the amazing Mazer. That <laughs> says Liam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Oh, God. Uh, I'll say um, I'll say April 23rd. You know, not, not a bad guess. Not far enough at, into the calendar, but that's a pretty good guess. Tyler Fiengas is April 29th. Craig Carlberg, 26th. The 26th Vincent, is almost there. Snake country. Vincent Croce said 28th which means that it's the 27th. And it's the 27th, April 27th. April 27th. 1967, somehow Philadelphia managed to record. Now, how in the world, on April 27th, 1967, did Philadelphia record one-tenth of an inch, and New York City, on that same day, probably didn't record anything? Or if they did record anything, it would only be a trace. Well, it's how not impossible. You know, maybe it's maybe one of those... Coastal systems from the Delmarva pass closer to Philadelphia. And or Britain. just, you know, some sort of little upper low or something. Something like that. Yeah. All right. Is there a bonus? And yes, there is the bonus question. And everybody's favorite bonus city. A place where a lot of people, by the way, took great pains to get to this past Monday for the total eclipse. Caribou. I'll say... Oh God! I'll say I'll say June second. No, it was not June. May. It was May. Well, thank God it wasn't July. Um, yeah. So, um, J Dog says May twenty third. Very close. Uh, Maggie P says May twenty fifth. And that's it, Maggie P. May twenty fifth, nineteen seventy four. Two tenths of an inch of snow. I can hear Tex Antoine now doing his nightly weather report on Eyewitness News and pointing to Caribou, which he often did, and said, and Caribou, Maine, today had, would you believe, two-tenths of an inch of snow. That's it for now. Back to you, Roger. <laughs> oh, good God. Any plans for the weekend? <laughs> Excuse me? Any plans for the weekend? Do I have plans for the weekend? Renata and I are going to be the uh, German American Club is having their veterans sal salute to veterans dinner 
on Saturday. And this, this actually is not a joking matter. I mean, the, the, the German club um, honors uh, veterans of, 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 of uh, past wars, of the armed services, with a special dinner uh, that is going to take place this coming Saturday night. And uh, so we will be there for that and uh, very happy to, happy to be there and uh, honor the men who've uh, served again in uh, various uh, chains of the armed services. Very good. I have nothing planned at okay. all. Okay. That's good. Nothing have, is good. I have nothing planned. I have nothing booked. Um, yeah, no, I got nothing going on. So we'll see. I'll figure something out. Maybe I'll go on a long hike on Sunday for the weather, with the nice weather coming this weekend. You know, here. there's so many people because the weather was so screwed up for the eclipse in places where everybody was planning to go, like Texas and uh, Arkansas, and whatever, that they all ran at the last minute to places like Vermont and especially northern Maine. I don't think, Joe, that Caribou, Presque Isle, St. John's, I mean, all those places in the far northern part of Maine probably saw more people on Monday than they've seen in God knows how long. In a, li in a lifetime. Holton, Maine, you know. Right. You know, where did you go? Where did you go? I, I went to a town called Holton. <laughs> Who the heck knows? Um <laughs> Madawaska. <laughs> Vecinapedia is working because where she works, they're having a stupid dirt sale, she said. Topsoil, three and six dollars, mulch, three and ten dollars. It's crazy busy. <laughs> well, it's good that it's on sale because that's one thing. If you buy, you know, for, thank God I don't have a lawn because, you know, the, the, the cost of fertilizer for, for grass is totally out of control. Yeah, I don't know when we're going to be able to. Uh, Renata always fertilizes the lawn, and also puts lime down on the lawn yes. as well. But before we do anything like that, Monday it's going to be pick up sticks day uh, at at the uh, Rancho Rayo because Joe, all the wind and it's going to be windy this weekend for goodness sake. I mean, all the branches, all the sticks from all the trees that surround my house, all on my front lawn now. And before I could do anything to the lawn, I got to go out and pick up the sticks. So it's gonna be a fun day on Monday. Well, I got this. that. To, I have that to do here too. After the wind from last night, there were tree tree branches down all over the place. It's probably, yeah. you know, I want to maybe do a little yard work this weekend. All right, uh, the Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system. Join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is on the descriptor to this podcast. Use the coupon code Winter twenty three twenty four so you don't leave money on the table. You get ten percent off. Yes. Or did you not know that? Oh, I knew that. Oh yes. Well. Yeah. Um, all right. So everybody have a great Friday and Saturday. We'll be back Sunday night at seven thirty-five. Ninety night. Ninety night, folks.